Hey gang, welcome to 40,000 Steps Live. It's awesome to have you here. I am Christopher Heimerman. I am your host. I am not a healthcare professional. See, what I am is I'm a guy with about a year and a half of sobriety. I've got some heartbreaking stories. They're going to turn into heartwarming stories. They're going to resonate. Hopefully, they will help you, maybe even help you help someone that you love. But I'm not a counselor. I'm not a psychiatrist or a licensed expert. I am a recovering alcoholic, and hopefully, I'm a guy who you can ask questions to, who you can share your story with, as we develop this relationship. Gosh, it's great to have you guys here. Now, even though I'm not a psychiatrist, my my guest tonight is. She's actually a psychiatric, I gotta make sure I get this right, a psychiatric physician's assistant and licensed professional counselor and personal trainer. I like to call her a unicorn because Jada Butler, my very own, I'm gonna say psychiatrist for short, but she's also a therapist. So not only is she the person who I can talk to about my problems, she also makes sure I'm taking the right sort of medications. Now, this is important to me because when I was a kid, I knew that there was something wrong and I couldn't figure out what in the blazes it was. It was this deep emptiness. It was this pit. And I couldn't figure out why it was going on. I was afraid to talk about it. I was worried about being perceived as weak or broken. And so I sat in it for a very long time. We're going to dig into that. This is our brand spanking new inaugural show, 40,000 Steps Live. It's also going to be a podcast. You're going to be able to find it on, a, on a Spotify and other places. But for tonight, we are live and we're going to be right back in a moment. It's a beautiful night for a run. So let's lay some up. It's 40,000 Steps Live. Hey, welcome back. So if you're new to the program, which of course you are, because the program itself is new, uh, here's how it works. If you have a story, a question, anything that you would like to share, please send it to 40,000 steps at gmail.com. My partner, Deshaun Johnson, who's the mastermind behind this whole thing, the producer, he's going to put up that email address. Matter of fact, there it is right along the bottom. Very cool. Oh, here, let me follow it this way. There we go. So you can remain anonymous. You can share your name, whatever you want to do. But when we get to the next block, which is the I Hear You segment, we're going to answer some questions live right here on the air. Um, let me tell you about my story. Now, I really started feeling this infinite sadness somewhere around like the time when I was listening to Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness by the Smashing Pumpkins. I'd be holed up in my room. I was off in my own world, afraid to go out. I loved sports and I didn't sign up for them because I couldn't, I, I just, I couldn't put myself out there. So I hold myself up in my room listening to August and Everything After by Counting Crows and Blind Melon's self-titled album. All these albums that were like these, you know, these, <laughs> these sad albums that felt like a place where I could hide and actually, uh, and be safe. Now, as soon as I stepped out of the room though, I was a happy kid. I was fun, fun loving. Um, and that's what everybody saw. And in the meanwhile, on the inside, I'm just aching and I'm in pain and I'm using my, my sense of humor to cover it up. Nobody knew what was going on. So why wasn't I honest with anybody? No, why didn't I tell my parents? Well, I didn't want them to think any less of me. I, I always wanted them. I mean, come on, we want our parents to be proud of us, right? And when you're a teenager, like anything that goes wrong feels like the end of the world, correct? So, I mean, imagine like, and I, I unfortunately, I bet a lot of you don't have to imagine this, you know, being afraid to tell your friends or your parents that you are immensely sad and you don't know why. You don't want to let them down. You don't want to disappoint them. So you just pin all that stuff down and you keep hoping that maybe you'll magically get better. I couldn't figure it out myself. So why would anybody have believed me? I mean, there was a real fear that if I told somebody, if I couldn't understand and explain it to them, how could they possibly believe me? So when I checked into rehab last March in 2019, I was so excited to finally be pointed to the person, to be pointed to a psychiatrist who would help me understand 
my diagnosis and to help me get on the right medications. Now, rewind 10 years from that, back in 2010, when I was working for a hockey team out in Michigan, I remember the first time that I went to see a therapist, I was like a ninja creeping through that parking lot so stealthily because I was terrified that somebody would see that the broadcast or the local hockey team is going to see a shrink. <laughs> and that's, that's what we deal with because there's this stigma that says that if we do seek help, that there's something wrong with us or we're weak when in all actuality, seeking help is a sign of strength and it's an opportunity to get stronger, but it's hard to get through to that. And again, that's why I'm so pumped that Jada is here to talk with us tonight so we can take an absolute sledgehammer to that stigma stuff. So, um, so I'm in, I'm in treatment and the nurse finally shares with me that she too had mental illness and that that was the root of her problem when she became an addict. And now imagine that moment. And I hope that if you're battling this, you can have this moment where you, you stop beating the living snot out of yourself for being an addict, for being depressed, for having, for having, you know, all these problems. Um, when, if you can control the root of the problem, you know, you can beat this thing. And, but there's this realization that it's like, oh, I didn't necessarily do this. I didn't ask to have my brain be this way. It was the way that I was made. So there's this stigma, right? Um, we all know somebody who we're all affected by cancer. We all know somebody who's had it, somebody who's close to somebody. Well, I mean, can you imagine how inappropriate it'd be if someone judged a cancer pa uh, cancer patient or survivor, if they thought of them as a lesser person because they got sick? Well, I mean, let's think about whether we're talking depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, these, these are all illnesses. And, and that's what we need to call them. And we need to treat them so that people can heal and get better. So, Really, it, it starts with a place of compassion and understanding and actually talking about the thing. And that is what we're working toward here. Now, not only am I excited to talk with Jada about this stigma stuff and how to break through that and how to get help, I'm also excited to talk with her about running. Jada was a Boston qualifier in the marathon. She is a personal trainer. She is an absolute, I, I don't know. I like When I met her and I started hearing about this, it got my... Uh, you know, all my competitive juice is flowing. So she's done a, a dozen marathons, a whole bunch of triathlons, and she's a personal trainer, works with experienced triathlon as well. Now, how about me? I ran a marathon the day after I got out of rehab. 10 out of 10 doctors do not recommend, but that was part of my story and why I started writing my memoir, 40,000 Steps. It was the fifth marathon that I had run and I'm going to tell you that running is my happy place. We're going to go ahead and put up a few pictures here. Let me put this up. Uh, one of these is going to be of me. Yep, that's me running the marathon the day after I got out of, out of rehab. And I remember barreling down that stretch and thinking about those last 100 meters. And I was thinking about how badly I wanted to do something great. I thought about everything that I was putting my family, that I'd put my family through. And that look of determination on my face says it all. It was like, I'm going to crush these 100 meters and I'm going to ride this thing into becoming a better person. Um, <laughs> let me show you my running team now, of course. Uh, that's Luna my husky on the leash. And those are my daughters, Elise in the front and Anna closely behind her. That's us running through our neighborhood. So that, that's my pit crew. And then uh, I, I also wanna show you a picture of a trail race that I ran last August. I mean, that that's the happiness, man. I, that's about three, four months after I had run the marathon fresh out of treatment. And yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, those endorphins, all those feel good chemicals that come from running, um, it, it, it is the greatest place for me. Uh, matter of fact, this afternoon, I got up for a run with Luna just to kind of get myself into the right mindset. And I'm kind of paying for it a little bit. Uh, I got up for like five miles and my quads are killing me. Anyway, I'm still getting better at running. I'm still getting better at being a person. It's one step at a time. Let's, uh, let's head to our next segment. Again, I appreciate you guys being here. Now we're going to take some of your questions in this next segment, which I like to call, I Hear You. Hey, 
Hey, welcome in, guys. As promised, this is America's favorite game. It's called I Hear You. The rules, super simple, super simple. Don't even write them down. If you send us a question to 40,000 steps at gmail.com and we answer it on the air, you get 40,000. All right. Yeah, you get 40,000 points. Yeah, here, let me do the math. Everybody who sends in a question gets 40,000 points. So everybody wins. The more you guys reach out and pick my brain and use my experience, again, not a licensed professional, but I've been through a lot of this stuff and I'm an open book. So give me the opportunity to hear what you have to say. And if nothing else, you know what? Even if I say, man, that that's tough. And I love that you shared. And this is a safe place for you to bring that up. And I'm going to do my best to, to give you my two cents. So Send us those questions. Send us your stories. You know, if, if you are celebrating an anniversary, again, you don't have to put your name on it. You can be anonymous, but go ahead and send us a message and tell us what you're proud of. And uh, we will absolutely blast that out there. We need to celebrate each other. So I got one question right out of the right out of the shoot. This one comes from Izzy. Izzy says, my brother drinks too much and he keeps trying to get sober. Now, I know he battles depression too, but he shuts me out whenever I bring it up. So what do I do? Well, this is, this is good. So, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like Izzy's brother um, is trying, maybe failing to stay sober. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to make guesses here, but he knows that he needs to address that problem, right? Now, not knowing her brother uh, my knee jerk reaction to the fact that he doesn't want to talk about his depression. I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before that um, when I realized that my depression and anxiety were a root of my drinking problem, I was able to get on the right meds, see a therapist regularly and attack that root, which at that point I wasn't healed. <laughs> I mean, I'm never going to be healed, right? I'm always going to have this addiction. It's how my brain is wired. If I had one drink, things would go very, very poorly. Um, but we need to set ourselves up with all the tools for success we can get. And one of those things for me was addressing the mental illness that helps everything else go. So with Izzy's brother, I mean, what it screams to me is that he knows that he has some unresolved problems, whether it be PTSD, trauma, or if it's just flat out that he's like me, where, you know, he grew up anxious and depressed, um, or at any point that something changed, if he, if, if he got hurt, that that needs addressing. So what do you do, right? Um, I, I, I think there's sort of this uh, ongoing mantra that I'll give you that what's always a good idea is to create opportunities for a, for a conversation and to come at those conversations from a place of love and support. Um, you know, so if Izzy, if Izzy is, you know, trying to talk to her brother about, you know, trying to get him to speak up, uh, you know, letting him know that, you know, she genuinely cares about him and, and, uh, I mean, maybe she can share some of the stuff from this show in that breaking through that stigma and knowing that if you get help, you know, that your life is going to improve. The beautiful thing about talking to a therapist or going to a uh, psychiatrist is this is, an, this is an objective person who is there to help you find solutions. They're like exclusively, exclusively there to help you get better. And nothing that you say in that room leaves that room. So maybe these are some of the things that Izzy can share with her brother is to give him a better scope of no, there, there are no downsides to going and seeing a therapist. I mean, hey, check, check with your insurance first. I to backpedal and say, check with your insurance to make sure that it's covered or that you know what you're going to be paying for that session. And I think Jade is going to point that out here in a little bit when we bring her into the program. Um, but apart from, you know, financial investment, that is between you and your therapist. And I think that only good things can happen by talking about them. Because if we don't talk about these issues that we've got bottled up, they fester and they, 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 they get nasty and they create more problems like 
for me, a drinking problem. So I hope that helps, Izzy. And Izzy, thank you so much for reaching out. It means a lot to me. I, I, I get... I get emotional whenever somebody submits a question because just by asking it, we're talking about that open dialogue and a chance to get better and a chance to heal. So that is the one question that I saw coming in. We're going to do this show every other week. So if you're watching this now and if you have a thought or a question, let us know. Send a, send it to 40,000steps at gmail.com right away, and we will get into it in a future program. Without further ado, though, I am so pumped about this. I mean, we're, we're coming out swinging the sledgehammer, taking it right to the stigma. My guest tonight is my, my therapist, my psychiatric a uh, physician's assistant. I, I guarantee that I'm, I'm not getting the title 100% wrong, but she is a rock star for me. Jada Butler is going to join here in just a moment here in the guest room on 40,000 Steps Live. So when you get out of treatment or as you're heading out, they set you up with therapists, psychiatrists, everybody sort of is sort of your program. You know, a lot of people coming out, they do outpatient. But one thing that they make sure that you do when you go out is you have the right professionals to talk to. And I don't know what I did in a previous life to earn Jada Butler, but I, I have an <laughs> rock star who I get to see on a regular basis. She makes sure that I'm on the right meds. We talk things through and it's, it gives me such great peace of mind uh, to know that what I'm doing is working. So here's Jada Butler. Jada, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, I, I see that you're in your workout room. Is this right? <laughs> Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. Yes. I thought it fitting to be in my home gym because um it's so important to incorporate exercise into healing, mental health. So um, that, and it's one of the only rooms in the house that I can have some privacy because all my kids are home from college. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, especially right now, we're living in this pandemic thing and it's the holidays. And the holidays, whether it be uh, solitude or expectations and stress. This is a tough time of year to begin with, let alone now that we're in a pandemic and we're making the hard decision not to see people. So, I mean, exercise, we're, we're not going to have like a real freeze for a while. It's relatively nice outside. I mean, getting out for a walk, going for a jog, lifting weights. I mean, that's, that, that's some of the best medicine, isn't it? It truly is. And it's, it's, it's underutilized. Um, it's something that I'm passionate about and I encourage all of my patients to do. And it is, it is medicine. It is medicine. And even though I prescribe medication, um, sometimes that's needed for sure. But what we can do with our own bodies and the food that we put in it absolutely impacts not only our physical health, but our mental health as well. And it's vital. Let's uh, let's get into a little bit of your background. We're going to talk about all of your races here in a little bit and the connection that we have with that. But first off, can you tell me a little bit about your practice? G give us the accurate title, please, because I guarantee that I got it wrong before. But uh, tell us about uh, about what you bring to the table, because I know it's a lot, but help our viewers. So it is confusing when you're looking for someone to prescribed medications and a therapist, often they're two different people. You go to a psychiatrist for medication and then you see someone different for therapy. So um, I like the phrase unicorn. I'm unique in that um, while I'm a physician assistant, so that provides the, the arm for me to prescribe medications, I also am a licensed professional counselor. So for me, it's important that I try to treat the whole person and I have adequate time with everybody. It's my philosophy is not 
here's your medication. I'll see you, you know, quick in, quick out. It's, it's I like to get to know um, my patients. It's important to ask about their physical health, their diet, their stressors, the way they, they, they do self-care. Um, and you need time to do that. So I spend that extra time with everybody and that's important to me. Um, and then I'm also a personal trainer and I try to incorporate the importance of physical health into um, overall wellness. And I just started a new business um, recently called Integrated Health and Wellness in downtown Wheaton. And I share the space with the Wheaton Wellness Center. And um, it's all about wellness and incorporating physical health, um, diet, and um, sometimes prescription medication to achieve overall balanced wellness. And, and that's my passion in life, so. Now, the, that starting point, of, of, of finding somebody and getting some help. It is, it is a daunting prospect for a lot of people, for a lot of the reasons that I've already described. Then you take into account that it, you've said it to me, it can be complicated figuring out who to see. And, and you told me uh, so often that starts with your insurance and your, and your GP. Tell me about the best way to go about, because every community is different. Um, I'm blessed to live in DeKalb where we have a pretty robust mental health community. Now, friends of mine in like Southwestern Wisconsin, where they live in a mental health desert, um, how do people start that process and make sure that they get, that they set themselves up for success with getting some help? That's a great question. And it is, can be overwhelming. First of all, I think to your point, a lot of people feel reaching out for mental health services is somehow some kind of weakness or character flaw or part of that's generational you know um you grow up with a you know you, you you rub some dirt on it and keep going you don't you don't say i'm in pain uh you just don't and so as a society we've kind of created this stigma that doesn't allow people to say hey i'm struggling i i could use some help here so um you know i i first worked in family practice and the reason I do what I do now is because so many people would come to the primary care as their first stop. And a lot of primary cares don't really like to do mental health and they would just, you know, get referred out. And I always felt like those people got lost because they didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. So the first place often is your primary care physician. And if they're not comfortable managing mental health, you can always ask, where do you refer? I'm looking for some mental health services. Who do you recommend? Your insurance is also a great source. They often have a list of providers locally and you can start there. One of the um, benefits, I guess, if we can say that of COVID is that most I know where you're going with this telehealth, right? Yeah, so most insurance is now um, have really stepped up and have made telehealth services available um, and at no cost to many, many, many people. So now you just have to ask. And there's um, there's lots of telehealth services. I offer telehealth. Most people do now. And it's a, it's a way that you can seek services from the comfort of your home. Um, and that has opened the doors for many, many people. So that's another great option too. Yeah, it, it's interesting how how devastating it was for a lot of people in recovery, kind of going over to the to discussing about um, substance abuse, when all of a sudden they weren't able to attend AA meetings, and then there was the big movement to online meetings, which I think that again, sort of a bizarre benefit. I think that opened up some doors to people where they could attend an online AA or smart meeting and be in the room without being, without having to show their face. So, yeah. I mean, we, we got to lean on whatever silver linings we can grab from 2020. So Absolutely. telehealth, telehealth and online meetings have been just that some unforeseen benefits. Now, Tell me about the difference between 
a, a therapist and a psychiatrist or somebody who prescribes medications because like there was a point where my GP was prescribing uh, my meds. And like I described to you earlier, it kind of felt like noodles were being thrown at the wall and whatever stuck, hopefully it works. Um, what, uh, what, what are some of the trappings there of, of how, how do you have to make sure that the right person is, is prescribing you medications? Well, that's, that's difficult because a lot of primary care physicians feel completely comfortable managing mental health, especially in rural areas where you don't have a lot of, a lot of other options, mm -hmm. but um, many do not. And often it's something you just feel, you know, I have a lot of people come to me and say, I just got the feeling that maybe my primary care didn't feel comfortable doing this, or maybe you didn't feel heard or maybe you had tried three or four medications and you were still struggling. And at that point, it usually becomes a mutual thing where they both, you know, the, the, the patient and the provider say, you know, why don't we get a second opinion? That's, that's a lot of what I encounter. People will, you know, land on my doorstep um, after not having maybe a few successful attempts and just decide together that it's the right choice to, to see someone like me. Mm -hmm. um, and therapists, uh, you know, can diagnose, uh, but don't prescribe, but they can be vital too. often therapists will refer to me for the medication piece. And then I will obviously, you know, refer to therapists when we really need to add that extra element of therapy alongside the medication management piece. Yeah. Um, shifting gears here a little bit. Um, I, I remember it was around this time last year that I, that I had come in for an appointment and we were talking about backing off on my meds. Um, or at least I was because <laughs> I figured things are going so great. Can we dial? <laughs> and you said, whoa, 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 whoa. It's the holidays. We're going to be seeing less sunlight. Let's, let's hold off until the spring. Um, I mean, and now, now we're living in a pandemic. How do you how do you handle this with, with your patients? What advice can you give to people in terms of self-preservation at, at this time? This is a really difficult time. I'm seeing people that have been OK struggle. Um, I, I'm completely you know, full with patients that are are seeking services for the very first time ever in their life. It's a difficult time. Um, it's stress all around. It's just compounded stress. And what makes it difficult is we don't really know when it's going to end. Most people can handle a finite amount of pain or suffering. They know, okay, fine. I got to, I got to suffer for six weeks. I can do this when it's ongoing and unrelenting and compounded and, and there's no potential end in sight, we start to become discouraged. So the holidays can add another layer of stress for some. A lot of people struggle with social anxiety. They get nervous being around family or crowds. And often, um, especially for people struggling with addictions, there's often a lot of, of alcohol or substances in family gatherings. And that can be really, really, really frustrating and very hard for many people. So in general, the winter time is a is a an uptick of depression and anxiety um, and substance use. Um, the gray days do not help. I do recommend all of my patients and anybody who's ever seen me know I'm going to ask two things: What are you doing to move your body every day? And are you taking mm -hmm. your vitamin D? Um, and tell me about your diet. So, taking vitamin D is important during the winter months making sure you have self-care, you know, you said self-preservation. You have to know what your self-care looks like and you have to practice it every day. The stress is going to be there. So you have to have a way to, to identify what those stressors are and come up with strategies so that you feel effective as you move through the day. And it's easy to reach for a glass of wine at the end of the day because you're anxious or stressed out. But what I encourage um, my patients to do is, you know, reach for your tennis shoes, go for a walk. Um, there are other ways to manage those those difficult emotions. I love it. Um, so, what do we do about this? Uh, what do we do about this stigma? 
I mean, how, how do we improve the way that this is, that society looks at mental illness and therapy and medication? What can we do? That's going to take a while. I think that, um, you know, people like you, people like me who uh, try to make it as welcoming as possible. Um, I can't tell you the number of people that come in to see me and they're terrified. And they say at the end of that, I was so scared to come in and see you. And I'm so glad that I did. And I think that we have to tell people just like what you said, you wouldn't, you wouldn't belittle someone for having cancer. Um, you know, mental illness is, is, is stigmatized because we think we have control over it. And if you are suffering with depression and anxiety, then something's wrong with you. But we wouldn't say that to someone with a broken leg or someone with diabetes, we would say, you should go get that fixed. Um, you know, when the last time I checked, my head was attached to my body. So uh, it's an organ uh, too, and it sometimes needs some assistance when it's not functioning properly. So we just need to change the way we look at it. Um, our, you know, we are whole beings and we need to approach our mental health and wellness just the same way that we attack and approach our physical health and wellness. I am really sorry if I was distracting just now. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of uh, a, a member of my pit crew, yeah, I did a show before this with WNIJ. I was a panelist for that. So I've been running this laptop up here and it was about to die. And my wife just delivered the power cable before, <laughs> before we lost everything. So this is great. <laughs> Um, hey, specifically, oh, and before we get away from that, I, I you know, one, one of the things I got the chance to share with the panel on there um, was, you know, you, you talk about exercise and the, the different things that we can do to make our brains healthy. You know, I, what I want people to do during these holidays is to be, is to check in on each other and mm -hmm. to, you know, I basically just, I remember when we used to call people on the phone, how novel that was and, and how it made you feel when you heard the voice of somebody who you care about. Yeah. I think that's some really, really important medicine that we can take during these holidays to buoy our spirits. And if you, I mean, one of my biggest failings when I was trying to get sober was I never, I, I would not pick up the call and tell people when I was upset, but I can speak from experience that now I do and I will be in a pit of depression. I will call my friend Natalie, or I will call somebody who I who who is like minded. And by the time I get off the phone, it, I, I'm just like I, I'm a different person. So I think being proactive and contacting people is going to be clutch this holiday season. Um, toxic masculinity. What do we, what do we do specifically about that? I mean, it's just. <laughs> I mean, we're, I, I feel like I'm kind of asking the same question where it's this rub some dirt on it. But I mean, this thing is just rampant, isn't it? It is, you know, and um, I, I don't know what we do about it, except that we keep having conversations and we keep saying that it's OK. Um, I think it's it's we have to make it OK, especially for men and young boys to say, I feel something, anything, you know, we have to make it okay that they can express themselves with sadness, just like they can with, you know, celebrating, a, you know, a touchdown on the football field, you know, we celebrate those joys and those highs, but we also need to lift up when they are, are hurting and in pain. And I think it's just being uh, that compassionate, loving, kind, place as parents, as people, as friends, um, to give permission to have a whole array of emotions and to be able to to express that um, and it be okay. And I think we're getting better um, yeah. as a society. I think we're moving in that direction mm -hmm. um, little by little. And and I think that um, part of it is, is our jobs as, as parents to raise our, our boys like we do our girls in that we give them permission to have those big emotions and, and embrace and celebrate that. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Um, you know, well, <laughs> some of my girls favorite activities is wrestling well, with, <laughs> with me and they're very much looking forward to playing some backyard football on Thanksgiving day. <laughs> so, yeah, we, um, 
but I, I love being a stay at home dad. It's, it's one of the greatest things, one of the greatest opportunities that I got. And another silver lining from the pandemic was that I was, you know, I was laid off and forced to be home. And, um, it was easier for me to embrace it than it might be for some, but it, it, it truly like when I really like took the hit to my pride being laid off and I moved through it and I embraced this opportunity to be a stay at home dad is it's, it's priceless. What do you say we talk about racing a little bit, huh? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So you're a Boston qualifier. You got a dozen marathons and we're going to show some pictures here. And can you help us out by, by, by sharing with us where these pictures were taken? I, I think we've got one, uh, one of you on the cycle. Here we go. Where, where was that one? That was Iron Man, Wisconsin, 2013, I think. How'd you do? I did better than the year before. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we talk about incremental gains. You, know, you talk about how we're getting better about toxic masculinity. It's the same thing with fitness. It's like as long as you're trending in the right direction, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was a fun. That was a that was a fun uh, Ironman course for sure. We also have one of you approaching the finish line. Where was this? <laughs> that was the Fox Valley Marathon. That um, is actually me with r my two rabbits for the race where my good friends, Carrie Bear and my husband, Russ, um, they were they were pacing me. And um, that was the first time I actually um, ran a Boston qualifying run, but it was, if you can see, it was like right at the, right at the cutoff, it was 3.52, so I made it, but it wasn't quite good enough. So I had to do it again the next year and shave off some time. Yeah. No, what was the cutoff? Was it 350? Three. It was three. It was 350. It was a 350 or 352, but so many people had qualified that I got bumped out. So. Yep. Yep. And then this next one we've got, this is, this is one of my favorite aspects of a race, the Mylar blanket. Oh my gosh. That was, that was after uh, Ironman Madison. Um, and that was, again, I finished that race with my husband. And um, I don't remember what year that is. I think it was still 2013. I don't remember. Um, I've done three in Madison, so they kind of run together. But I, I think that was 2013. And there is nothing better than the finish line of an Ironman race. Nothing. Yeah. It's... Um, it's rough. It's up there. And then, of course, we have <laughs> the medal picture. Was it with Experience Try? It was with Experience Triathlon. That was Galena. Um, that I actually tied for, I think it was third place um, for my age group that year. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm still wearing my bike shorts under those pants. So you can see, like, this really attractive line across my leg. <laughs> I did notice that and I was going to bring it up. So. Um, you know, tell me, you, you work with Experience Triathlon. Tell me about your role with them, what, what you do for them. Sure. I am a, um, a coach for Experience Triathlon. Uh, coach Joe has been my personal coach for about 10 years. He and Coach uh, Susie are probably the best people on earth and um, they have been wonderful coaches uh, for me and mentors in my life, personally and professionally. And I am a, um, I am a, a coach for them. And I also am a strength coach. So I do a virtual strength class every week. Very cool. Now uh, that's Joe Lopresto and Susie Sarah, correct? Yes. And they were actually experienced triathlon was a, was a client of mine when I worked for running awards and apparel. And I totally agree with you. I loved working with Joe and Susie. So whether you're working with kids or you're training somebody uh, or you're talking to somebody in your office, somebody who uh, who you will you know be working with to help them uh, with, with uh, you know prescribing medicine, et cetera, compare and contrast those things. You know, training somebody for athletics and uh, trying to train somebody um, to get better uh, to, to better enjoy their life. To me, they're parallel. And I'll, I'll tell you why. 
So I've been an athlete all my life and it wasn't until I actually um, started training for Ironman that I actually saw how training for a race brought um, unprecedented um, gains in my personal life. It was through training and breaking through um, preconceived notions of what I thought I could do. And then mm. I would go out and do it. And I'd be like, what? I just, what? I just ran like 20 miles. You know, I mean, everything that I thought was my limit, I broke that limit of what I thought I could do. And so doing that on a training course or on a race course made me then start to ask, what can I do in my personal life, professional life that I thought were once limiting concepts to me? Starting my own business was something I never, ever thought I could have done. And it I think it was because of the gains and the struggles um, training that allowed me to start to move into um, new spaces in my personal and professional life. And it allowed me to understand the transformative power of exercise and being moving pieces in our lives for big things, whether it's personal or professional. You, you, we hold ourselves, we, we limit what we can do sometimes we have to break a barrier like on a run or a swim or a bike where we go wow how else am i holding myself back mm -hmm. just because of my preconceived notions of limitation mm -hmm. and that to me that's why i think they're the same uh, and sometimes i'll use physical training as a way to say see so you didn't think you could do it and now you did what else in your life do you think you can't do let's mm -hmm. challenge that Let's challenge that now. So you take some, uh, you get people to take little little bites, and the next thing you know, they're at the buffet. I I, I love it. And it and and they're like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? And I'm like, well, I'll tell you, how you got there. <laughs> <laughs> so you said, what if? And there you go. That's it. Every great is fine. I, I you know, as a as a journalist, I always preach to my reporters: the best stories always begin with "I wonder" or "What if." Setting out with that sort of curiosity. Um, well, Jada, you promised that you were going to give us some reps before we before we sign off here, right? Are you gonna Are you still doing that? I'm gonna do you. What am I giving you? So some reps. I mean, we we see the oh, we see the way it's set in the back. I am so not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a prop. All right, that, that, that's fair. Hey. I cannot possibly thank you enough for coming on here. The opportunity to uh, to uh, to address stigma, to attack it, and try to create a space for people to to love themselves and to grow and heal. It's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. You're doing a you. wonderful thing. You keep it up. Uh, and I will and I will see you soon. I will see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gang. Well, let's take a moment to reflect here. It's been a fantastic show. And I think by and large, the best thing that we can come away with tonight is that we need to talk to each other. We cannot assume that people don't know what we're going through. We cannot assume that people are going to think of us differently when we bear our souls and when we ask for help. Every time that I have asked for help, I have grown, I have become better. Oftentimes I've healed and I've realized my potential. Grab onto some of that, man. Even if it's us with the program that can help you, send us an email to 40,000steps at gmail.com. And uh, if you've got a question, if you have something to celebrate, share that with us. We'll feature it in an upcoming program. Our next show is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be bringing on the happiest man on earth. Bobby Greenia owns Champions Pub, which was kind of my home away from my apartment during college. And we're going to talk about the role of the bartender and the bar owner, because I have to believe that it is not an easy role, especially if you're as awesome of a guy as Bobby is. And you see firsthand, People who can handle their alcohol, which a lot of people can. Props, man. I wish I was one of you. And people who can't. 
So we're going to get into that and so much more. Guys, take care of one another. Reach out to each other. Reach out to people who you don't know whether they need help and reach out to the people who you know need help. And if you yourself need help, pick up the phone and call. Only good things can happen. Folks, remember, when it feels like everything is coming apart around us, right here, we're coming together. Love you all very much. It's been 40,000 Steps Live. We will see you very soon.